Looks like we're live. Okay, we're here, we're live. So welcome to everyone that's uh, watching this video. Uh, my name is Greg Andrewerden. I am the owner of Debt Brief. Uh, I'm a lawyer and- uh, like We're live. Yeah, we're here. Okay. We're here, we're live. So welcome. Okay, we're, uh, go ahead, got some reverb here. Um, we're here with uh, Casey. Uh, Casey has generously uh, offered to be here with us today on this uh, video. Um, Casey has is recently going through a debt collection lawsuit. Uh, he reached out to me and we recently did a couple of coaching sessions. Um, and he has generously offered to be here and sort of discuss the process so that anybody else that's interested can kind of, I guess, learn from his experience of their being sued so it can help them. And, uh, and, and likewise talk about, you know, kind of what we went through together and how I was able to help you a little bit. So I don't know, you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Yes. Uh, my name is Casey. I'm, uh, uh, in the state of Nevada just for reference. And, uh, so not all things that I talk about here will apply to where you are from. Uh, but wanted to say hello to everybody out there and that's joining us and, you know, thanks for being here. And thank you, Greg, also for having time to do this. Yeah, of course. Okay, so I just want to ask you a couple questions kind of like about your experience and uh, we can just see where this goes and you can ask whatever questions you have about the process. I'm sure it would be helpful to whoever's watching this, but uh, you, you, you've you obviously been sued by a debt collector. So kind of tell me like, without going into the details of your specific case, like what were kind of like the initial feelings that you had when you were sued? Like, like how did that come about? And uh, you know, what did you think like about like, oh no, what am I going to do about this? So yeah, again, for reference, I'm I'm sort of in my late forties and I, this is the first time that anything like this had ever happened to me. So uh, when I received the documents, I sort of just stood there slack jawed, like, wow. You know, I, I, it just, it didn't even, it took a while for it to even compute what was really happening. And uh, it actually took me a couple of days before I got over that shock and started actually reading through documents and then figuring out what I needed to do next. Um, the most important thing that I needed to do next, and that was actually, uh, you know, provide an answer to the suit. Yeah. So uh, let me ask, how, how were you served with the summons? Uh, somebody came to my uh, my house, and uh, it was it was funny. He he looked at he he handed it to me, and I, I I wrote down the date when it happened because I knew the date would be significant. And uh, it turns out, of course, it is because you have to answer within a certain period of time. But the uh, the individual just looked at he just looked at the papers and said, "Are you this person?" In you know, you live here. Yes, here you go. Looks like you've been sued. Looks like it's for a, a car or something, but you know, you should be able to deal with them, you know, directly. And he just walked away. And I'm like, a car? What is he talking about? So, and then I just looked through the paperwork and I saw, I saw you know, kind of where he got that thinking. But I was really surprised at how much he spoke. I just figured he would hand me papers and leave. Um, and then I just, you know, kind of jotted down the date that I physically received it and then got over the shock and then started doing research on what I needed to do. Yeah. It, you know, it's interesting, different, uh, different process servers will handle it differently in my experience, at least some of them will be, you know, friendly and say, yeah, I'm sorry, you know, this has happened. Let me explain to you a little bit about what's going on. Some of them will, you know, be more like you see in the movies, where it's like, oh, you know, open up the pizza box and the papers are inside kind of thing. Some are just lazy. We'll just leave it on the doorstep, honestly, which is why I, I asked the question because, you know, a lot of people will be like, I found this in my mailbox. Like, do I have to respond to it? Or they're like, that's not going to be adequate service in most cases, right? They've got to physically, they've got to have human to human contact, you know, so whether that's a process server coming to the door, which is probably the safest approach, or it could be certified mail where you got to sign for it. Right. Something. Right. Uh, so um, I guess you got it. I don't know. What what was your inclination? Did you 
I, I know a lot of people will sometimes be like, oh, I've got to call the attorney and find out what's going on. Or some will say, I definitely, I don't even know if I can talk to the attorney who sued me or, I mean, did you think about anything about that? Or maybe you never even wanted to talk to them. I, I'm curious what your thoughts were on that. Though. I did think about it and I was more concerned that I wouldn't be equipped to speak to the attorney without um, knowing some more things. And so I really had to determine what about this do I want to contest? Now, keep in mind too, this, this summons and complaint was the first that I had ever heard of the company that was the plaintiff that was suing me. I had never received any other letters. You know, usually there's a, a letter that gets sent out um, after initial uh, communication. Uh, you know, within five days, there's FDCPA requirements for sending out a letter that says, hey, this is this is who we are. This is, you know, this is the, the debt. Uh, do you want to dispute it? I never received anything like that. So um, now that's not to say that they didn't send it. I, I'll say that much, but I did never receive anything. So the summons and complaint was the first thing I saw. And I have an attorney's name in there. I don't know if I should contact them directly or not. My, my, my spidey senses are tingling saying, do not communicate with them directly unless you have representation or you know what you're doing. You know how you want to proceed. So I didn't. Um, and I basically took the approach of what do I have to do to keep this from turning into a default judgment? That was the first question that I wanted to answer. And it turns out it was the answer. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you know, there's definitely like nothing wrong with contacting the attorney on the other side. And I, I think when you and I met, you know, what I say is like, if you want to get this debt settled or into a payment plan or whatever, like that's how you're going to do it is contact the other attorney. But I think, I think what you say is wise where it's like, it's not don't contact him. It's don't contact him unless you have legal representation or you know what you're doing. Just call, I mean, the, the worst thing that you could possibly do is call them up and say like, hey, look, I know I owe this. Yes. Can we put it on a payment plan because they're going to be recording you. I mean, we all know when you call the debt collectors and they have those recorded things when, when you first dial, it's like, you know, this call may be recorded. Yeah. For, for, you know, this office collects debts and anything you say may be used. We'll see whatever. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, so then I guess you, you filed your answer and it seems like um, that, uh, you know, most people don't even get to that. Most people, I think, just ignore it and it ends up in a default judgment, right? Like you were at least, uh, you know, you at least recognized, okay, I've got to avoid a default judgment. Default judgment just being, you don't even do the most basic step of showing up in court saying, I dispute this. Yes. Um, so you're like, I'm going to avoid that. You file your answer. So you're already in like the top 5% of people by filing your answer. But, you know, I guess what happened next after you filed that answer? Because, I, you know, that this is where, you know, a lot of people that don't file an answer, I never see because they're just ignoring the lawsuit. They get a default judgment. But people show up to me and it's like, okay, I filed the answer, but what next? I don't know what to do next. So what, I guess, what were you thinking there? What did you well, do? Well, once I filed the answer, um, and I actually went and looked up the register of actions online for my state for my for my case number, and I was able to see that it showed in the documents there was the summons and the complaint, and then it showed the court recognized that I had answered the suit. Nothing else was happening at that point, and I checked it literally three times a day, Greg, I kid you not. I'd go in and look in the morning. I'd go in after lunch and look and see if anything was moving forward. If there was some kind of pre-trial activity or something, I was getting nothing, nothing, like nothing going on. So uh, one Friday, um, a couple of weeks ago, actually, it was actually longer than that. This would have been in June. I received a, a letter from the opposing attorney of a three-day notice of intent to file default on me. And my, I was, I about exploded. What are you talking about? How can they do this? Was my thinking. I've answered the suit. They have no way to do a default on me. They could go for a summary judgment, but mm -hmm. how could they go for a default? And so that sent me down 
another rabbit hole. And I spent three days and three nights unable to sleep. I couldn't eat, sleep, nothing. I, all I did was work on a motion to dismiss. And, and I wrote this motion to dismiss with all of the, the bells and whistles, all of the, the full MOPA, you know, format, everything, case law, all these things, basically saying that the plaintiff had no standing to sue. Uh, and I also sort of accused them of having unclean hands in the process. And I was using this three-day intent as part of the, the reason why they had unclean hands. Because under the FTCPA, I was, I was arguing that they were doing, they were basically saying they were going to do something they couldn't legally do at this stage. So I, I just, I was, I went off the rails, Greg, I kid you not. And I, I put together this document, I submitted it, I sent it, you know, through mail to the opposing attorney. And all of a sudden my motion shows up and I get a motion date. And this will be the first time, this next week will be the first time that I will actually be heard in this court over this. And it's because of the motion I filed, which, you know, I actually thought the process would be different from what I've been reading in the, the rules of civil procedure and all that. But when that three-day notice of intent was filed, my first thinking was, I have to do something to get the judge to hear me that I am disputing this. Yeah. That was my only concern at that point. And I literally didn't sleep or eat for three days while I wrote and researched. I couldn't. My anxiety levels were way up here at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And just I was anybody, in fight or flight mode and it was all fight. <laughs> yeah. For mm -hmm. anybody listening, like there's a distinction between default judgment and summary judgment. Default judgment being, hey, you, you haven't appeared in the case. You're, you're not defending yourself. So we're just going to give the plaintiff what they're asking for. Summary judgment being, uh, you know, there are no disputed facts here. Like both parties are here and they put their facts forward and it's like they don't disagree on what has happened. So, you know, that might be like you've admitted that you owe the debt or, you know, they you don't dispute that you had a contract or whatever. That, that would be summary judgment. So you're saying, oh, man, I did. I, I answered the lawsuit and they're still trying to get a default judgment. They're telling the judge, I, I. I didn't answer when I clearly did. So your thinking was just, I just got to do something to get to get in there and have him hear me. So uh, let now, me what, whether that was good thinking or not, you tell me. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think you want to avoid a default judgment at all costs, right? Like <clears throat> um, you just want to make sure that like the judge isn't going to rubber stamp something they do. So, you know, what I always tell people is if, if something gets filed by the other side, asking the judge to do something, you should file something in response, telling the judge why he or she should not do the thing that the other side is asking for. Right. So, you know, just put something in front of the judge to let the judge know that you disagree. Now, who knows, you know, judges are going to rule how they rule, but you're at least going to, you know, put something in front of the judge that says, hey, I, I disagree. So at least let me, you know, have my say before you rule against me. So now you, you know, I guess you're getting ready for court. You took, I guess, kind of a unique approach because most people don't do this. You decided I want to be comfortable going into court my first time. So I'm going to go watch court. Tell me about that process. So I went to the court with three goals in mind. My first goal was to look for any cases where the judge that was going to be seeing my case, I wanted to watch how he interacted with pro se, either defendants or plaintiffs. I wanted to see the interaction with people who are, who are representing themselves and how, how, how the judge sort of interacts with those types of people was very important to me because that's kind of where I'm at. The other one, I wanted to actually see cases where uh, the opposing attorney was going to be there representing other debt collection activities so I could observe how they are in court. That was another goal. And then I found cases specific to the plaintiff, and I wanted to see how their attorneys dealt with that plaintiff's case. Um, and I will tell you, uh, I did this weeks in advance. So I printed out, I went up and printed all the different cases on the dockets that fit these requirements, whether it was, you know, for this particular creditor, this particular attorney, 
the opposing attorney uh, in, in the case or this judge. And uh, yeah, so I spent several days going down to the courthouse. I had time to do it. Some people don't, but I did. And uh, every time that I was an observer, I ended up being the sole observer in these courtrooms. And, and the judge did call me out. He said, so we have an observer in the courtroom. And so I had to, you know, introduce myself and I didn't bring up anything about my case. I just said that I was there learning and writing about how uh, pro se litigants interact with the court system. And the judge was actually very interested in that. And it, it, so it was very interesting. What I observed, I was, I, I consider myself lucky. The, uh, the judge was actually very um, level-headed with pro se litigants to the point where he was willing to explain things that I wouldn't have expected a judge to do. Um, I was very encouraged by that. Um, I didn't see any hot-headedness. And he wasn't the only judge that I observed, by the way. There was more than one that I got to observe. So I, I saw a lot of really good things there. I did not get to observe the opposing attorney because those cases never ended up coming up and probably um, right before right or got kicked out yeah right and what i will tell you is, is of the 13 cases that i looked at um mine was the only one where there was an actual answer and you know basically saying that you know a dispute with well, the rest of them were all basically defaults or in some form of a default yeah. Uh, when I go to these hearings, and, and a lot of them these days are, it'll be on like WebEx or Zoom, and uh, we'll, you'll show up and there'll be like 50 cases scheduled and the judge will say, okay, are there any cases that have settled that we can just like summarily take care of? And then, you know, then it just, you know, whoever raised their hand or whatever, and you'll do these. And it'll be like, okay, this one's settled, great, we'll dismiss it. This one's settled, great, we'll dismiss it. And then it's, and then there'll be some where it's like, oh, uh, we've agreed to push this hearing out, you know, for three weeks. And then they push all those out. And then it'll be, okay, the default judgments, this person's not here. So this is what order we want. Okay, we do those. And then there'll be like out of those 50, like three or four that will end up being like disputed issues that end up you know with the hearing and those ones you, you usually have to wait till the end because the judge just wants to take care of all the quick stuff so that there's not a bunch of attorneys sitting around billing time and so you're going to dispute it you're probably sitting there watching everybody else first at least that's my experience that may be what happens i mean it was um i i'm not really sure what will happen that day but the reason i the other reason i went to to the courtroom was so i could see the layout of the courtroom where I would be expected to be, where I would sit or stand, et cetera. I noticed there was a podium there. And so I I have intention of using that podium when I'm discussing things with the court. I'm preparing for that instead of just standing at my counsel table and doing it from there. So yeah, I, I think that's a good idea for people. Like go to the courthouse beforehand to see you can orient yourself. I mean, I imagine. I mean, I'm a lawyer. I still get nervous when I've got to go into the courtroom. And it's, uh, I, I can't even imagine what it's like to be someone in your situation, like the nerves when you've got to pull into the parking lot and then take the elevator up and, you know, go to the door. And it's like, do I go in this door? Like, and then, and then a lot of times like court will just be going on when you walk in, right? So you like walk in and they're in the middle of a hearing or something and you're like, can I walk in? And everybody turns around and looks at you and so I think it's I, I I think that's a great idea. What you did is to go early, watch your judge, watch how these hearings work. And I guess did you you just I assume went on the court's website and found a calendar for? I did. Yes, I found one for the specific uh, judge first, and uh, and I actually found out that my case is actually the first one in the morning. So I don't know if I'll be the first one they'll call or not, but I intend to be there a half an hour early. So. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, you definitely don't want to show up late. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's online, you definitely want to make sure that you've got you know proper internet connection. Um, you know, you want to dress at least the court the courthouses that I usually go to. They'll have a sign on the door that's like, if you're wearing shorts or tank tops, turn around and go home and change before you come back. You know, so 
It's interesting you say that. They, they, they did have signs like that on the courtroom, but one of the, the pro se defendants that came in was wearing shorts and the court didn't say anything to him uh, about it. He wasn't asked to leave or anything, but I did notice that the, the judge did explain to him certain things about the process. It was like, without representing him, just helping him understand what was going on. Uh, I, I, I was actually rather encouraged by that. I, but I, I really want to go in, not to be like the actor, but I really want to go in and have a substantive understanding of how I want to explain things in the courtroom and, and organize my thoughts, expecting questions because because this particular judge is known as a hot bench judge, which means that he reads everything that you reference as far as cases. One of the things that I didn't do, and I wish I had done it when I submitted this motion, I went up and looked up the rules of this particular judge's court. And one of the things that I didn't do with my motion is that everything that I referenced, I'm supposed to include that in my brief. Every, you know, if it's a case, if it's a, a piece of case law or I'm referencing some USC code or something, I didn't do that. So I have, I want to make sure that when I do go in, I have it prepared to offer the judge before I start talking. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I'll tell you, too, what, when I've watched judges deal with these pro se litigants, um, you know, I, my sense is, and I can't speak for every judge, obviously, but my sense is they, they really do, they may very well rule against you, but they don't want you to walk away confused as to why they did what they did. And so, you know, my experience is judges will typically explain like, okay, like you're losing today, but here's why, like, I need you to understand why, because I don't want you to walk away and be upset that you lost and you don't, you can't even explain to somebody why that is. So in my experience, most judges are pretty good at explaining to people without lawyers and why things are happening the way that they are. So, well, let me, yep. let me ask you this then, um, you know, did yeah. you consider hiring a lawyer to help you? I did. Um, and what I found were the pricing for the assistance was so prohibitive. I, um, but my thinking on it was as well, if I was going to give you money like that, and I spoke to three different attorneys, by the way, if I was going to give you five to $10,000 and you're already telling me that I've already lost and that you're, I'm going into bankruptcy, that's really the only thing you have to do. Then how are you representing me for that kind of money? I could be offering that, you know, for a settlement option or something. I can so, lose on my own. I don't need you to lose for me, right? Right. And so I was really stunned by that. Um, and I was actually really kind of stunned at how there was no there was no real advocacy. It was more like, well, you're in the wrong. You know, if you owe this debt, you're in the wrong. So um, you're going to end up paying it. You can pay me to help you uh, negotiate. Uh, and that ended up being even more than representing me in court which didn't make any sense. None of it made any sense to me at all. So I was really kind of surprised at that. And I opted not to go that path. Yeah, I think that's the most um, unfortunate part of, uh, of the uh, debt collection process. It's just like, uh, financially, it's so tough to hire a lawyer. You know, like, look, I, I am a lawyer. Like, so I... You know, I understand that, like, you just can't take on a lot of those kinds of cases. I mean, sometimes you'll do it on, like, a pro bono to help somebody out. But, like, there's just so many, I mean, such a high percentage of the total cases are debt collecting cases. And almost none of them have lawyers because, number one, they're probably in debt, so they can't afford it anyway. Right. And two, even if they can afford it, it doesn't make financial sense to do it. I mean, which is really the reason why I started Debt Brief because I was trying to figure out how can I help people that need a lawyer, but it, either they can't afford it or it doesn't make financial sense to do it. Right. So, so yeah, I, I had thought about it, but I just decided it wasn't the, the best 
course of action that I could take under my circumstances. Yeah. Well, how did you end up finding me? Doing research, um, spending a lot of hours reading. I think that's almost a requirement to be in the law profession anyways. You got to like to read. Um, sure. But I was more trying to find anybody anywhere. I, I honestly couldn't find anybody in my state. So I started looking at people in neighboring states that could offer any kind of courses or um, documentation uh, that could help you navigate these minefields of this of this whole process. And I did find you uh, and I found well, I found debt brief first, obviously, uh, debt brief, you know.com. And so I, I started looking at what you had available. And I became interested in coaching because it's something that you offer, which I I was stunned. I, I thought your pricing on it was unbelievably good for a person who's trying to learn. And I uh, was very interested in that primarily. And I became more interested in other things later as I started moving into written discovery, mm -hmm. uh, which um, is something else that I think you just recently started offering uh, a tool for that. Yeah. Well, why don't you tell me, we did a couple of coaching sessions. Uh, I obviously, you know, can't give legal advice on those. I'm not your attorney, you know, so, but, but I don't know. How was that experience for you? Uh, the experience was very personable. You're a very personable guy, Greg. I don't know if anybody else has told you that you're, you're pretty, <laughs> pretty easy to talk to. I think, um, I would love to see you actually do stuff in the courtroom because to me, you seem so so nice and easy to talk with, but I would love to see the other side of that in a courtroom environment where you're not nice because people forget, uh, you know, a courtroom is a battleground. It's basically, it's a battlefield and you're, you've been invited to that battlefield or, or like a hockey game without pads you, you and you're the center of the fight, you know? So I, I would love to see you in an advocacy, you know, way being in front of a courtroom and not being nice to the opposite side and see what that looks like. <laughs> my, my feedback when I've been in court is that I'm harsh and overbearing and loud. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Damn, I wish you had a recording of that because I would love to see it and see if I could learn something from it. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know about that. Well, I guess, you know, you obviously, you know, you talked about uh, this new product that I just started offering these discovery requests. Yes. So I guess explain for me what your thinking is on you want to send out written discovery, you know, kind of what were you, what were you looking at? What were you thinking about? And how did this product help you? Well, um, so written discovery up to this point, my understanding is that I'm in what's known as a pretrial stage of of the uh, the process and so the written discovery process uh, i'm still waiting actually for the other side to send me things okay i'm not looking forward to that i'm already feeling the butterflies in my stomach just thinking about it but with the written discovery um what you had put together for this sample discovery request for a debt collection defendant it uh one of the things i like about this is that you really didn't hold anything back with any of this, you cover everything from, you know, interrogatories to uh, requests for production of documents. Again, a very important piece uh, in a debt collection case. And then even the request for admissions, which when we talked about it, I think you referred to those as Hail Mary questions, essentially, yeah. uh, to try to either get the side to admit or deny something or hopefully and not respond to it at all because then it all becomes admitted fact. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, so I, I used these uh, and I had to be very careful. One of the things that I know I had to watch for is that when you're doing interrogatories and, and all these various forms of written discovery, you're basically trying to get information, but you're also trying to judge for yourself how strong the case is against you. Um, do, you know, what do they have that can verify that you are the correct person um, and that you're the one that owes this debt and that they're the owner of the debt? Those are all, you know, 
there's a lot of ways to punch holes in their case, but you can't unless you've done some kind of discovery uh, first. And uh, my probably the easiest document that I did of all of my written discovery was the initial disclosure. I don't know if that would be considered part of discovery or not, the initial disclosures, because sure. I yep. really don't have anything. I don't have a witness. I don't have any documents that I can offer. So it, you know, that was probably the easiest. But the thing that I had to be careful of when I went through, I had to make sure that in my interrogatories and in my request for admissions and all that, that I didn't ask for things, um, basically ask for the same thing more than once, because that can be objective to um yeah, and, so and i had to make sure that what i picked you send, mm-hmm. right you're you're limited in correct the yeah. every so you don't want to ask for the same thing twice because that's going to be you know if you've got 20 that you can send or whatever and you know you don't want to use two of them that is correct and so, yeah so i had to look up the nevada rules of civil procedure for uh the various rules dealing with interrogatories and requests for admissions and requests production documents to see what my limit was. I didn't even come close to my limit, by the way. Um, But everything I picked was very surgical in terms of, you know, zeroing in on the the things that I wanted most of all to be brought to the record, you know, instead of going all over the board and asking for everything under the moon, I, I wanted to ask for things that, you know, either either the, uh, this debt collector would not want to provide, um, or can't provide. So those, that's what I'd really put my focus on. Yeah. I mean, I I think in a debt collection case, like these written discovery requests are really your only good way to get information you need to defeat a, a debt collector. I mean, like, you know, when I have other kinds of cases in my law practice, you know, we, uh, you know, we'll, we'll regularly do like depositions and, and, and things like this, but like, you're not going to take a deposition in a, in a debt collection case. I mean, it's like the expense isn't justified. You don't know how to do it, you know? So it's just like you send these and it's so, I mean, it's relatively simple to do. I mean, maybe I, you wouldn't say it was easy because you probably would put a lot of thought and effort into it. But I mean, it's relatively simple. You take these forms, you fill in the questions that you want to ask and you send them off, right? I mean, right. Like, so, it's, so it's a, very, a relatively simple process. It's just a matter of knowing what to say. Right. And I think this product that I've got out there helps you know what to say because I've got like 107 different examples of things you can Yes, you do. And, and that's across all the different areas of discovery. And you also have in, in the other documents that you offer on your on your website, actual templates for these requests for admissions that do contain some instructions and things like that. Um, and so that you don't have to think about or worry about where to get that language. It's already there for you. You just have to sort of put in the stuff that's most applicable to your case. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'll tell you too, I don't have this up yet, but it's coming soon. Mm. Uh, will be a, a list of objections that you can yes. use. They, when they send you the discovery requests, right? You've got to answer those interrogatories, requests for production, request for admission. And I think a lot like people that, you know, pro se people like don't know objections. I mean, even when we hire new attorneys, like brand new attorneys out of law school, they come in, they're like, I don't even know how to object or what are the appropriate kinds of objections. So what I'll have coming soon is for sale is a list of objections that you can put in those discovery responses. So if, you know, you can, it'll help you determine, is this an inappropriate question that they're asking me? And can I object so that I do not have to answer that? So right. that will be helpful as well that we can get you before they send their, their discovery. Well, if you want if you want to use me as a guinea pig for that, I was going to ask to uh, basically do a coaching session with you when I receive mine yeah. and kind of, you know, see if we can apply it to some of those things. Because here's, here's the number one thing, you know, that I've learned from figuring out what all of these things mean in terms of written discovery. You don't want, you don't want to be dishonest. You can't be, but at the same time, you, you have to be careful how you respond to these questions, because if you give anything 
that takes away areas of the dispute that are substantive, then they can just file for summary judgment and you're right back where you started again. Yeah. So you have to be able to keep the dispute going. Yeah. That's what I'm nervous about when it comes to me receiving them. Yeah. So we'll see. Tell you, you can't really, I mean, it's hard. I shouldn't say you can't, but it's hard to mess up a case by sending discovery requests, right? They may, you may not do the right ones and you get what you're looking for. They may be shifty in how they answer those or whatever, but where, where people really get messed up, the people that I meet with that like really end up in bad positions are the people that don't know how to respond to the discovery requests, right? Because, you know, you're like, okay, I'm going to fight this. I file my answer. So I'm good there. And then they get these discovery requests. They don't answer them. And boom, next thing they know, summary judgment. Because yeah. I, I, it's the most critical thing. And if you can defeat summary judgment, that is where you've got a really good shot at beating the debt collector. They just don't want to go to trial. Or, or it's hard for them to prove. You and I were talking before we got on this call that where you can really beat a third-party debt collector, at least, is they've got to have the appropriate witnesses come to trial. And are they going to get someone from, you know, whatever the original creditor is to show up at trial and testify about the contract that you had or the credit card agreement that you had or the loan agreement that you had? It's going to be hard for them to get that person there at trial. So their best bet at beating you is discovery requests. So if you know how to answer those, you've got a, like your percentage chance of winning goes way, 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 way up. Right. So, yeah, so I'm not sure, you know, what's going to happen, you know, on Monday. Um, I, the, in the motion uh, response to my motion to dismiss, um, the uh, opposing attorney, the opposing counsel um, mentioned, you know, no harm came to him, you know, because of what we filed. So it's just, you know, he can start requesting written discovery and uh, everything can be handled at court annexed arbitration. So that's, you know, I, I feel like I'm just sort of being dismissed already by the other attorney, by what they wrote. Um, where I, I took all this time to write this brief that had all of this reference to case law. I, I probably went way ahead of myself, but the whole point was just to make sure that somebody heard me, you know? So I, I wouldn't take too much offense to them being dismissive towards you. Attorneys are dismissive to other attorneys too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's just the way it is. It's, it's hard. It's hard not to be when you're, when you're fighting and arguing not to be snippy and, Rude. It's something you've always, as a lawyer, you've always got to make on. You don't want to do that way, but you often are. But, so. Fair um, enough. Okay. Well, um, let me ask you a few more questions. Sure. I, I assume that going through something like this causes a lot of anxiety and worry and fear. How have you, how have you dealt with that? For me, it was just getting lost in the research uh, and realizing that I'm not alone. Uh, when I saw, I, I read a thing from the Harvard Law Review that talked about how um, these types of cases are jamming up courts all over the United States. So, you know, you're, I am part of a much larger machine of where these people are just being run through a legal meat grinder, right? And for me, the one thing I can't stand is a bully. I've never liked bullies my whole life, and I've always stood up to them, and I've always been willing to fight. So I see what I'm going through as being bullied, and there's this use of the um, the law system to basically bully me into submission. And I, I don't submit very well. I, I never was able to get pinned whenever I was doing uh, wrestling in high school. And, I, you know, I just I'd never give up, never give up, never surrender. And so that's kind of what sort of kept me going through this whole process so far. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, I mean, I, I think it's just a matter of like. You've got to just be prepared and know as much as as you can know. I mean, probably before this, you knew nothing. But I mean, just in talking to you, it seems like you just learned a lot about the court 
process about the judicial system. And, you know, it seems like it's healthy, at least from my perspective. <laughs> I still have a lot to learn. I, you know, I can't even, I'm not a lawyer. I can't even say I've played one on TV. So I, I, I have a lot of disadvantages here, but you know, one of those, one of the strengths is that I'm willing to be wrong, fail fast and move forward. And um, I just want to make sure that if I'm going to fail, I want it to be on something that's not going to destroy everything I'm doing. So, you know, that's, I'm spending a lot more time trying to be thorough and crafting a good argument is the next thing that I'm really trying to work on. Yeah. Well, and you've obviously already found the rules of civil procedure for your state. I mean, I assume that's not light reading. I mean, but you seem like you've made your way through them okay, and you're at least kind of understanding what you need to know from there. Because to me, like, that's sort of the Bible of what you need to do in your case is the rules of civil procedure. So, like, how's that been trying to learn those? You know, um, at first it was dry reading until I started focusing and zeroing in on the specific rules that I needed to focus on for the type of case that I'm in. And so that that made it a little bit easier for me to focus Um, because a lot of the the rules of civil procedure are crafted, you know, around federal rules. And so a lot of the, the numbers of the rules are similar. Not always. In my case, they're very similar. So it makes it a little easier to look them up. Uh, the other thing that I've been sp- spending time on is Nevada revised statutes. There are some areas of the revised statutes of law that override federal rules, and, and in particular with areas of, of documentary uh, evidence and hearsay, business records. So I've been trying to make sure that if I'm going to craft an argument and use this, I want to use the one that's going to give me the most power. Uh, in, in some cases, it's going to be the revised uh, Nevada revised statutes instead of federal, you know, statutes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Actually, I did want to ask you a question yeah. that sort of relates to that. Um, yeah. Do you know if Utah has incorporation of business records uh, exceptions um, or they have incorporation of records uh, that can be used? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, like, like, can they be used in court? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, where the uh, where the um, the plaintiff can say, "Oh, we've incorporated these records into our own," when mm-hmm. they're a record from another another entity. See, Nevada does that, and so I have to be prepared to challenge that on the basis of them, you know, putting them up to task to say when was it incorporated. You know, right. at what date and time did this become a part of your business records when it belonged to another entity? So right. those are, yeah. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Utah does not have that. Um, but just to give some background here to anyone watching, you know, the key is you can't just show up to court unless you're in small claims court. But in, you know, if you're doing a trial, you can't just show up and say, well, here's the contract, right? you've got to what we call lay the foundation that this contract is a real contract and and then it contains hearsay because these everything written in it is something written outside of court so that you have to you know get it for, in through an exception you know every state's going to be a little bit different there but if you're looking at like federal rules that's you know the most common one is going to be business records you and I've talked about this a little bit before but you know so they've got to have somebody that shows up that says okay this contract it's a real contract so we know it's authentic and then this is a, a business we use in the regular, or it's a record we use in the regular course of our business here. It's part of our business records. And then boom, now we can move to admit that into evidence and the judge can take a look at that contract and decide whether based on that contract you owe or not. So the idea being that if you want to defeat a debt collector, you want to you know, make sure that they can't get that contract into evidence by challenging the witness you don't actually know when that record was incorporated into your business records. You don't actually know if it's a real contract or if it was fabricated. You're just saying that because your lawyer told you to say that. And so, Judge, I object to this record coming in because there's no foundation for it. So, yeah, like those are the kind of things you want to prepare for trial because all you know evidence has to come in through witness testimony, including documentary evidence. That, and so they have to lay the foundation to introduce those records and evidence. And I've, I've seen it, I, you know, I go to trials and 
you know, wh whichever party is not prepared to lay the foundation. They just thought the other side was going to stipulate or agree to the record coming in. And, and when you object to it, they panic. I mean, you can see it in their eyes. Oh my gosh, I don't have a witness here that can lay the foundation for this record. How am I going to get it in? They can't. And I mean, it's the death knell for their case. And as, as someone being sued by a debt collector, that is what you're hoping for. You know, is that they cannot prove that part of their case. Now, you're not in total control of that. I think you need to know that and, and you need to be prepared to challenge the foundation of those records. But ultimately, if they do their job correctly, they're going to have the witnesses, they're going to have the documents, you know, and they can beat you. But you want to just make sure that that only happens. They have the, everything that they need and they can do. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let me just ask you before we finish then, um, you know, what you're still going through this process. So what, what are some additional like resources that you think would be helpful to you or things that you feel like you still need to learn? Anything like that? Well, objections. Um, objections would be very useful to me. I've actually been doing some, some sidebar research on that. And actually one of the books that I'm reading on the rules of evidence um, actually talks about common objections, but really understanding how to use them properly. I think that's going to be important. Um, you know, I'm still early on in this process. I don't know how long written discovery will go on. I, in some of the cases that I saw, written discovery had been going out for months and months between the parties. And I thought it was a hard stop at 30 days. You don't have it, you know, that's it, you know, then you, you know, but apparently I'm wrong. I guess that it, this can go on however long it goes on. Well, it's, it's going to vary by state. Every state's going to have different rules of that in their rules of civil procedure. Uh, you know, but like a court can issue an order or sometimes it's set by rule or statute how much time and it could be, you know, depending on how big or little the case is, like how much money is a controversy that, that could change. But, you know, typically you've got 30 days or around 30 days, maybe it's 28 or something to respond to those. But as long as you're in that discovery period, you can continue to send discovery, you know, back and forth. And eventually the court is going to set a cutoff date for that, whether they set that cutoff date early or whether it's just been a long time and the court brings you in and says, hey, it's time to move this case along. But unless there's a hard cutoff date, yeah, that discovery continue continue to go back and forth. So, so I, you're obviously getting, you know, you need some help with objections. Anything else that you think would be helpful to learn? Um, you mentioned depositions, and I, you know, if this actually does end up going to trial, um, I would think that I may have to learn on some level how to do a deposition. You know, especially if um, I receive affidavits that look questionable um, and I, you know, need to start asking these witnesses that sign these documents that say this is valid or that's valid. You know, how, how would you go about that process um, and how to do it properly, how to cross examine a witness um, to get the most important things out there in terms of the types of questions that you would want to ask that would show this person doesn't know what what they're actually talking about they, they they claim to know this but they can't know this because of this and this um that type of thing though i mean again that's a little further down the road yeah. so but those are the things that i'm looking to do you know at this point yeah my first hurdle is getting through monday okay. without you know without being feeling like i've been skinned alive and i i actually feel very encouraged that I won't be. Um, I don't think it's going to end on Monday that I'm just going to have a judgment against me. I think I've already spoken up enough there. The hurdle after that is going to be the written discovery. I've already sent mine. And you you even told me, I remember you saying, if you send this stuff, you're going to throw these people for a loop because they're not going to expect it because they don't typically get this from somebody who's not Most represented. Yeah. And so I did already. Uh, I did want to ask one thing about written discovery, too, that pertains yeah. to everything we've talked about. 
if you you have the ability to amend and re request something else, if you're still within that discovery time frame. I mean, you just send another request, right? So like okay. so when, when we send discovery, you know, oftentimes we will have like a stock set that we will send right at the beginning of discovery in, in every case, right? And you might go through it and say, ah, you know, we need to change some because this case is a little unique or whatever, but we basically, we've got our stock set that we'll send out, right? Now maybe you'll get a response back and you'll say, well, I have a question about how they answered this one. And so then we'll send out what we'll call like a second set of discovery requests that, you know, questions about this, 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 like follow-up, follow-up questions. Or maybe we'll take a deposition. You know, this isn't as common in debt collection cases. We don't do a lot of depositions in debt collection cases, but other types of litigation that I have, you know, we'll, we'll get, uh, we'll depose a plaintiff and, you know, maybe as we're as we're asking them all these questions in a deposition, we're like, oh, okay, there's a lot of documents this person has that we don't have yet. And so right after the deposition, I'll send out a third set of discovery requests asking for all those documents that came up in the deposition, for example. So yeah, I mean, it's all going to be dependent on court rules, you know, and how your court interprets that and what kind of limits they place on that. But yeah, I mean, as long as discovery is open for the most part, you just send another set of discovery requests. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And, and you know, going back, you were talking about depositions and cross-examination. I mean, depositions are tough. I mean, you've got to be real brave to try and take a deposition in a debt collection case. It is just a situation where you are setting yourself up to get abused, in my opinion. You know, because yeah. you're going up there against a lawyer who knows what they're doing in a deposition. I'll, I, you know, I've got horror stories from some of my early depositions about, you know, how terrible I did because I didn't know what I was doing. But you mentioned cross-examination too. I think cross-examination is a technique that is much more valuable to someone like you than taking a deposition because that you're going to do in court in front of a judge, you know, who's not going to let you get abused by the opposing lawyer in the same way as if you're in a deposition without a judge there to referee things, you know, to right. stop you from getting bullied. But yeah, cross-examination is going to be key if you're going to a trial and you need to sort of, you know, make those objections and demonstrate that they don't have the foundation to prove that, that you owe this debt. So, yeah. Yeah, are you planning on putting together any kind of video training on any of these uh, types of uh, types of things? Yeah, uh, that's that's coming. I mean, okay. there's a lot there's a lot to do to help people, but yeah, that that will eventually be coming. It's it's on my you know whiteboard list of, of things to do and put out on the website. Okay. So, no, okay. like I said, use me as a guinea pig, man. I'm fine with it. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely get you involved when we're ready to. <laughs> Okay, so just to finish up here, um, you know, hopefully there will be people watching this that are in your situation that are like, I, you know, I need some help. I just need to know. So what you, as someone who's going through this, what advice do you have for someone else who just got served with a sentence? My first bit of advice would be to take a breath, take several breaths. Don't forget to breathe. It's very important. Know that you're not alone, that there are resources out there. There are plenty, uh, plenty of options for you to traverse this giant chasm between you being sued by some entity you've never heard of and at least leveling the playing field for yourself. Um, and debtbrief.com is a great place to start with that as well. Uh, and also, don't be afraid to ask for help. You know, ask for a coach. The, the 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 greatest athletes of our time all had somebody who coached them to greatness. Now, I'm not saying, Greg, that you're going to turn me into a Michael Jordan here, and that I'm going to turn into some kind of, you know, magnificent, you know, uh, trial wizard. But you don't have to be a wizard to win. You 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 have to know the rules of your area, um, and you have to be willing to learn. Step out of your comfort zone a little, and um, do some reading, do some research and figure these things out, but you don't have to do it alone. Uh, you've, you've proven that already, Greg. And I, I very much appreciate your interest in helping. Uh, your interest in advocacy is very admirable. 
Well, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, it's it's what I always tell people is like you you have no idea what you are supposed to do when you get sued, but you are you are absolutely capable of taking these cases on by yourself. Like obviously a lawyer is going to do a better job than you, but like I already talked about, that just isn't feasible or cost effective for everybody. But like if you're willing to put in a little bit of time on the research and you know use a resource like Debt Brief you know, to help you learn what you need to do, like you you absolutely are capable of doing it. That, that's that's the message that I want to put out there to people is like, yes, you can do this, you can handle this on your own. <laughs> All right. Anything else that you want to share before we before we log off here? No, I, I think that um, I think I'm looking forward to some of the other new things that you have coming out. Hopefully I'll, they'll come out in time for me to be able to use them for some of the things that I'm working on. I, I honestly don't know how long these processes normally go. I mean, I guess the only other question I would ask of, of you is, from your experience seeing a debt collection case from the beginning to the end of a trial, what was the shortest one you saw and what was the longest one you saw that you experienced? That's a good question. And I don't know if I can think about that. I, I mean, shortest ones, I mean, gosh, it's, if it, if it was short, it's probably, I mean, you're probably looking at like a year, just really by nature of, you know, you've got, you, you, you've got to get served with the summons and then you've got a month to respond and then you've got to do disclosures in some states and then you've got to send out this written discovery and then you may have pretrial hearings in there. And, you know, a lot of times those hearings get kicked out and, and you know, then it's like, okay, we need a trial. And then it's like, well, you've got to find time on the court's docket. So, yeah, I, you know, it, it certainly could be shorter. And, you know, my experience may not be everybody else's. You know, the exception to that, I guess, is and which we haven't really talked about here is small claims court, where you don't go through all this discovery process and it's small amounts of money. And it's you get that summons and it's like, hey, you need to show up next month for a trial. You know, those ones obviously happen quick. But just it's it's I think a lot slower moving than most people expect. I think most people are like, okay, I'm gonna file my answer and then I'm gonna wait for the court to tell me to show up for trial. And that's just not how it works. And I think you know you're you're likely to get to a trial more quickly if the parties are pushing the judge to set a trial. But if the parties aren't asking for that trial, I mean that case can just sit there for months, honestly. You know, I have a lot of people come to me that'll be like I sent my discovery requests, I got responses, and I haven't heard anything from anybody in six months. What do I do? You know? And so, yeah, it, things can just sit. And there's just a lot of sitting and waiting, too. It's not like things are always happening. You've probably experienced that, too. I mean, where you're, like, checking the docket three times a day. It's like, no, things don't, definitely don't happen that fast in law. It is a slow moving machine, so... Well, anyway, thank you for taking the time to, to be here today. And hopefully this was helpful to anybody watching to hear your experience and, and realize, hey, I'm not the only one going through this. But, so thank you for that. And just for anybody watching, you know, obviously head to debtbrief.com is where we've got all these resources there. We've got the forms for sale, the sample interrogatories, the objections will be up there for sale soon. Obviously, if you want to sign up for a coaching session with me, like Casey's done here, just go to the website, fill out the form, and, and we can get you scheduled. So, um, Casey, thanks again. Good luck on your on your case, and uh, hope you beat them. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate it. And for anybody else out there listening, I hope you beat them too. <laughs> yes. Well, that's what we want here is we want to take down as many debt collectors as we can. All right, take care.